the, the consideration of contract rail, which I'll briefly look at, and also the uh, compare and contrast table, which is just worth looking at for a moment. Um, if you turn back to page 268, please. Uh, you can see it paragraph 60 that there was an argument it's I would say it's the same argument raised in this case that the contract uh, 69 marina is is per incurium contract real and I'll come on to how the argument is developed in a moment but while we're here on the facing page, page 269, there's a, a, a useful table prepared by Judge Cook, which sets out not all of the cases, but the clauses from a lot of the cases in one useful place. And it, it makes good the point that the contract rail clause is rather different from the others. Um, although, uh, for whatever reason, it misses off Roman three, which was proceedings for the recovery of any of the rents reserved from the bottom of the contract rail clause. But if, if the compare and contrast was of any use at all, there's a useful table. And um, Judge Cook at paragraph 69 on page 270 says that despite the difference in language, um, all of the clauses are attempting to do the same thing. Um, Paragraph 70 is, uh, deals to some extent with the per incurium point. Paragraph 70 uh, is, uh, paragraph 70 and 71 indeed, are where Judge Cook makes the same point which I made to the court this morning, that it's quite clear that 69 Marina was dealing with both parts of the clause, both the in contemplation part and the incidental part, um, and Judge Cook deconstructs the judgment and explains why that is so. Um, and I know I was picked up uh, this morning by referring to both limbs of the clause. I was sort of echoing what's said at the end of paragraph 72 of Judge Cook's judgment. She meant incidental and in contemplation. And at paragraph 73, I referred to in my skeleton argument, and I said I adopted the point, so I ought to um, effectively read them into my submissions for a moment. Um, Judge Cook specifically says that she didn't think the decision in 69 Marina would have been any different if contract rail had been cited, and she gives um, three reasons, um, one of which narrower clause. Um, and the second point, which she refers to more convincingly, is where she refers to the decisions relied upon by Lady Justice Arden as being all cost decisions and emphasizes the words in that context and says it's not at all obvious that it can be extended to a different context. Well, the, the context, I think, there is what she's getting at, is that in contact, contract real, the argument was that they would be incidental to the subsequent set of proceedings, whereas in Ken Square, the argument was that they were incidental to the Section 146 notice. So that's, uh, in my submission, what... Um, Judge Cook uh, is picking up there. Sorry, can you just... Um... She doesn't say what the context is, having italicised it in paragraph 73. So what, what Judge Cook says is that the Court of Appeal would have distinguished contract as being... Uh, because the authorities relied upon by Lady Justice Arden in making the cost decision are all cost decisions. She was careful to point out that incidental to has a time-hallowed meaning in that context, i.e. in the context of court costs or costs of proceedings. And it's not at all obvious that it can be extended to a different context. What is the different context? The different context is of an incidental to a section 146 notice. difference between cost incidental to proceedings and cost incidental to a 146 notice. Yes. In this case, 
you rely on the costs as being incidental to 1467? Precisely, my Lord, yes. And I do submit, as I submitted this morning, that the decision in 69 Marina is on what I call both limbs of the clause, which is the costs of the previous proceedings could either be in contemplation of, or they were, of an incidental fee. And uh, I made my submission independently of Judge Cook, but Judge Cook takes the same view at paragraph 70 and 71 that, con that 69 Marina is relying on both, as she puts it, both limbs of the clause. Uh, and they're not interchangeable, are they? They are referring to different situations. Well, actually, Judge Cook possibly wouldn't have accepted that because she refers elsewhere in her judgment to the torrential drafting of leases and says that different forms of words are used effectively to mean, mean the same thing. And um, I think I can... Yes, paragraph 68. So you're saying for the purpose of proceedings is the same as incidental to? Uh, uh, they, they all effectively mean the same. In contemplation of, for the purposes of, incidental to, um, they're all getting at the same thing. As, as Judge Cook, anything done for the purposes of serving notice is also done for the purposes of taking proceedings. As I observed above, leases are beset by torrential drafting and the use out of caution or of habit of more than one expression often does not mean that more than one thing is meant. Well, I suppose that's, that last bit is a slightly different point. If you use more than one formulation, do you mean different things? But if, on the other hand, you've used one formulation, which is, say, for the purpose of, as opposed to in contemplation of or incidental to, those three things might mean slightly different things. I have to accept they certainly might do. Um, whether they do do, um, I, I suppose, is the question. And um, in the context of this kind of contract, uh, uh, contractual cost recovery clause, then in my submission, they don't mean anything uh, different. They're, they're all, to, to again, to adopt um, something Judge Cook said, they're all effectively getting at the same thing. It's the preparatory steps where if the tenant, this is the Barrett and Morgan point, if the tenant pays up, you never get to the court and you never get your chance to claim court costs or to claim costs as part of the conditions of relief. Except that you could contemplate something and um, as, as the um, example of the instructions clearly revealed in the case you took us this to this morning and which satisfied the Vice President that there had been in contemplation proceedings um, but at that stage, unless you can point to what you've done in contemplation of those proceedings, you couldn't say that they were incidental to them, could you? Um, you? You can contemplate that um, you may take proceedings next week, but you still haven't um, prepared the account or instructed the surveyor to take the account or whatever. So there are no costs incidental to your contemplation almost. Um, I, I do see the point um, which your ladyship is making which in a way helps I'll take the bit of it which I like if I may <laughs> <laughs> because it, it helps my point about the, that you don't actually need um, a great deal of evidence to satisfy contemplation because it's of necessity a much looser more remote word you can contemplate something you never do. Can I ask you whether you're but, allowed to rely on contemplation? Hmm? Is, are you in the scope of this, with, with, in the context of this appeal, able to rely on contemplation? I suppose we get there on respondent ground one. I mean, for the purpose at the moment, I think I'm entitled to answer my lady's question. Yes, please. About the difference between the two without necessarily being able to rely on it. Um, but yes, I, I, I would. I would ask uh, that I can rely on the contemplation ground in, in the alternative. Um, I was just going to look at the... It's not very obviously within ground one of the respondents' notice. 
Well, this goes back to the point about the withdrawal of, of ground three, which raised the contemplation point. So when respondents noticed ground one was prepared, contemplation was raised by ground three. My learned friend withdrew ground three or decided not to rely upon it, having been asked by the court. Um, and that... She might have seen the force of your argument, the first part of which was that the appellant should not be allowed to pursue ground three. Yes, but where, do, where does that leave ground one? Uh, given that it was in effect responding to the contemplation point. I, I would submit that I should still be able to, to run ground one, which refers to contemplation in the alternative. Strictly, ground one says, had the appellant properly sought to challenge before the court the factual basis of the respondent's claim that the cost proceedings were in contemplation? Um, well, it turns out that there was no finding the FTT that the proceedings were in contemplation. Well, that, it was because of the way ground one was developed in the, sorry, the way ground three was developed in the skeleton was the way I put it uh, that way. Um, because paragraph 28 says, this has to be considered if the ratio in 69 marina is preferred, which I'd submit it will be, or should be. Um, then paragraph 29 says, the appellant submits Dis Deputy District Judge Paul failed properly to consider the ratio and said, uh, which didn't go so far as to suggest that proceedings for recovery would re result in an automatic ability to recover legal costs. A separate evaluation was required as to whether, on the, in reality, on the papers, there was evidence that the landlord actually contemplated forfeiture of the lease. And then paragraph 30, which refers to Willans, is, is about the meaning of in contemplation. So therefore, I responded to that by saying, well, there is evidence of contemplation, which is the, the letter of claim, or in the alternative, the indirect evidence of the letter of claim given by Ms. Iqbal in the statement, which is... Yes, exhibited. but your, your first point was that they should not be allowed to run that ground. Yes. Um, but going to the, the, the question I asked, um, in this case, um, just suppose for the moment there had been, um, before the Deputy District Judge and he determined upon the same, um, the instructions between a solicitor and client that uh, this was a necessary step. Yes. So you've got the cost of the solicitor giving that advice to his or her client. Yes. Um, but before anything happens, it, bets are off for whatever reason. Mr. Khan decides that he is going to pay, or that the local authorities say, look, you can't pay this all at once, we're going to get an instalment plan going. Yes. So there's contemplation of, but the only costs are the advice given, and presumably billed for. I think I, 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 would, I would have to accept, I think, the point that whether it's in contemplation or incidental to, there comes a point when the Section 146 notice isn't going to happen. And your ladyship's given a perfectly good example, which is that a, an instalment plan is entered into. Now, at that point, or from that point onwards, there couldn't be contemplation of or incidental to uh, a Section 146 notice, because factually, at that point, it's never going to be served. So that, that does bring uh, a guillotine down. And in fact, there, there might be said to be a point in this case where that arises after, and I emphasize this, after, indeed well after the hearing in front of Deputy District Judge Hall, my client decided to go for an interim charging order. Now, I, I would accept that at that point, it might be said that there couldn't be costs in contemplation of or incidental to forfeiture because they'd elected a different route. An agreement, as your ladyship said, would be another point where that uh, guillotine comes down. But on the facts of this case, that hadn't arisen by the date of the hearing in front of D Deputy District Judge Paul. All options remained open at that point. And uh, as to the point about the fact that no Section 146 notice was in the end actually given, um, I, I do submit that uh, at that point, there isn't actually a, a distinction between in contemplation of and incidental to, because the costs 
uh, until you've decided not to serve the 146 notice, I would submit that the costs are incidental to the preparation and service of it, because you're still going through the necessary first stage, the Section 81 claim, getting the determination to put you into a position of being able to elect whether or not to serve. You're going to. Whether or not you're going to do it. Mm. Because it's been pointed out, and even if you had intended, absolutely 100% intended to do it right at the beginning, you would still have to say that couldn't be a settled decision because until you've got your Section 81 determination, you have no idea whether you'll be permitted to do it or not. It's got to be contingent. I suppose you've had a, a very settled intention not to do it because, for example, um, the tenant has a physical disability or other problems that mean that you would not want to dispossess or fit. Uh, you certainly can have a factual situation where either because there's no evidence or because it is positively not your intention to forfeit, uh, and in that case you can't rely on this form of contractual cost recovery clause. No. I accept. Okay. Um, and that's the decision in Barrett which is upheld in West India Key. Can I be clear what the facts were in this case? Because Ms Simak told us that at some stage an arrangement was entered into to pay by Installments. What happened? At the time you started proceedings, he was paying off the service charge by arrears? He was, arrears? At, at the time, my, my instructions are there was no deal or arrangement. As a matter of fact, the uh, appellant was, and indeed continued, to pay off £50 a month, sometimes additional payments. So he was, as a fact, paying off by instalments, and you can see that in the FTT's decision. That's why the, the decision went 3665. The claim was for 4,900 and something. So he had, as a matter of fact, been paying off. But that's not by virtue of some agreed payment plan? Not my instructions, no. And what happened after the FTT's hearing? Um, well, he continued making the payments, but the arrears actually rose. So the, the figures... Uh, were, I think, by the date of the um, hearing. Yes, by the date of the hearing in front of Deputy District Judge Paul, the arrears were £6,725.95. That figure includes the amount determined by the FTT and sums falling due subsequently, but less the payments. Uh, and there are some schedules in the... Um, so you, your instructions are there was never any arrangement to, um, there wasn't paid pay by, by instalments. No, I mean, as a matter of fact, he was, and, and as a matter of fact, money was being paid, but um, no deal. If there had been, um, before the district judge sent it off to the first year tribunal, a very good indication that. Mr. Khan had embarked upon this instalment plan and that it, he was paying as much as he could in the circumstances. Ms. Simak's point is, well, you know, at that point, the, the contemplation of any other forfeiture proceedings has gone. My lady, the, um, at this point, I, I think I am fairly entitled to say, you know, we, we're really embarking then on, on a detailed factual investigation which didn't didn't take place. I mean, it, it is possible, I suppose, that Mr. Khan might have said, well, in fact, they can't contemplate it because we've been talking and we've had, um, you know, we've done a deal and this is not going to happen. But that didn't happen either. No, it's all it, speculative. So yeah. tell us what did happen, because when we look at the transcript of the hearing before DDJ Call, Mr. Hardman was telling him he didn't need an evidential basis to do what he was being invited to do. And looking at the judgment, um, DDJ Paul seems to have taken him as his word. Yes, DDJ Paul um, effectively accepts everything which he's told by the claimant. Um, which you accept as mistaken? Um, with, with the benefit of hindsight and knowing now which to be fair to Mr. Harbour, I'm trying not to throw him under a bus. Oh, of course not. Um, he didn't. He didn't have the benefit of the West India Key decision. Yes, you said that, but we we now know 
with the benefit of hindsight, that there's no automatic his invitation to DDJ Paul was mistaken. Yes, and DDJ Paul wasn't in a position to, or didn't take the opportunity to say, well, actually, I think you do need to show me that this is incidental to. Yes, that's a, a, yeah. a fair, fair characterization of what happened. Yes. So he was he was lured in. He accepted the submissions of counsel. I suppose yeah. all, all judges accept the submissions of counsel. Yes, well, okay. Mr. Hardman was no doubt a very good advocate, and so we're left in the position now where um, DDJ Paul appears to have made a decision without evidence, even though you say there is uh, evidence that we can be sure was before him because of that that witness statement. Yes. Is that enough if DDJ Paul said, well, I don't need evidence, so I'm not going to look at it, I'm not going to analyse whether it's sufficient or not? Because that's Miss Simak's other point, that there was no sufficient evidence before DDJ Paul for him to make that decision. The, the, the sufficiency of evidence point in, in my submission is, is simply is wrong for two reasons. First of all, because the hurdle is very low to establish the landlord's state of mind for contemplation. Um, because contemplation itself doesn't require uh, very much, and I would say the same state of mind, the same linkage required uh, for incidental. And um, secondly, um, I would rely on um, Ken Square in the Upper Tribune, and I would say Judge Cook was right, that it is sufficient to say, well, if, if, if you've written a letter saying that you're contemplating it, well, what more can there be? Well, that's if it's in contemplation, we let you run it. But equally, I would say that would... Uh, the, the, the argument that you need some evidence to show that it's incidental to... Um, I'm, as I said this morning, I, I am denied about it. I think the, the danger in me saying that you don't need any evidence is that it looks a lot like saying it's automatic. And the Court of Appeal in West India Quay very specifically said it's not automatic. So I think... The reason it's not automatic is because you can have these proceedings in the FTT without there being any exactly. prospect of Section 146 at all, because yes. the landlord just might not be thinking about forfeiture. Yes, which logically means there must be some sort of linkage, whether you rely on purposes of contemplation of or it's incidental that. to. So there must be some sort of linkage. But if you do accept that there has to be some sort of linkage, then the evidence which satisfied the in-contemplation of, in my submission, also satisfies incidental to. So effectively, your submission comes to this, that, that in practical terms, whether it says incidental to or in contemplation of, it's much the same thing. Yes. And that a, and I will also go to the Court of Appeal judgment, which um, I would submit is, uh, is supportive of that. Is, you mean in Kent Square? Yes. I, I was looking at that again. Well, I see you're going to come on to it, aren't you? Um, I'm going to come on to it with a bit... With, slightly more trepidation than I might have done in the <laughs> um, only, only in the sense that actually um, well I was going to come on to it now so I should, I'll, take, I'll take this on the chin my lord yes Ken, Ken Square which is a tab if you 20. look at paragraph 43 the, the mast I pinned my colours to was actually for the purpose of yes um, yes I do, I do see that, that you, you did in the dot 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 you didn't put incidental to in there. Yeah. Um, so I, I appreciate that I can't say that paragraph 43 of Ken Square gets me home because you don't directly deal with the point. And I, and I, I do appreciate and understand that. Um, nevertheless, um, what I was going to say about paragraph 43 was it was a broader point, which is that there's nothing in paragraph 43 which suggests that a, a close examination of the modest differences which appear in these various forms of clause uh, is likely to be the appropriate approach. Um, and you don't, uh, and my lord, you, you do quote at paragraph 39 of the judgment, you, you quote paragraph 67 and 68 of Judge Cook's decision, and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you suggest that Judge Cook is wrong in those paragraphs where she says, um, 
This is the torrential drafting point uh, at the end of paragraph 68. And, and the entire argument in Ken Square, what was a very, you know, a very closely argued one, which was to try and say, well, it made all the difference that the words in contemplation, sorry, that the words proceedings were omitted from the Ken Square clause, but they were found in all of the other clauses. <coughs> And that submission did not find uh, favour, uh, my lord, with, with, with you or the other members of the court. Even though, as you put it, paragraph 41, Mr Fields End maintained that the omission of proceedings was deliberate and, and significant. Uh, and at paragraph 42, uh, you also make the point that comparison with leases in other cases isn't a reliable guide. Yes. I mean, the... The, the, the best, I, I suppose, one comes back to the point that if, on the basis that I, I hope I satisfied your lordships and, and sorry, my lady and your lordships this morning that 69 Marina is not per incuria, uh, I would also uh, hope that I have established that the decision in 69 Marina is both in contemplation of and incidental to. And if that is right, and I'd submit that it is, then um, that is enough um, to get me home subject to the evidential point. Um, and, and it, it may be I mean, the incidental to Lim is exactly the same as this is the incidental to bit of our clause. Uh, you can put the, the two clauses uh, side by side, my lord. If you, it's the clause in in sixty nine Marina, I think, is is set out in a slightly different order. So the the clause in sixty nine Marina is set out at the bottom of page 169 uh, page, page in the bundle. And then the clause in the current case, probably most conveniently find it set out in my skeleton argument, at paragraph 9. So, in, in 69 Marina, the, the two parts of the clause would run in the reverse order. So, 69 Marina is to pay all expenses, etc. Incidental to the preparation and service of a notice under section 146, or incurred in or in contemplation of proceedings under section 146 or 147, notwithstanding that forfeiture is avoided. Whereas, in the present case, it's all cost charges and expenses uh, incurred by the lessors in or in contemplation of any proceedings in respect of this lease under section 146 or 147, and then including, in particular, all such cost charges and expenses of and incidental to the preparation and service of a notice under the said sections. So the incidental to the preparation and service of a notice bit is identical, really? Yes, just it comes second instead of first. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that... So although there are linguistic differences, there are no material differences, I would submit. Uh, and while I, I, do, I do appreciate, um, my lady and my lords, that you know, we, litigants can expect that the way they put their case is the way their case will be judged. I fully take the point about the way Mr. Hardman put the case to the deputy district judge. But um, what then happens is grounds of appeal are then put in, points are taken, which are completely different, for obvious reasons, from the points which are in front of the district judge. Um, and uh, what it, it would be a difficulty in my submission to say, well, because counsel, even though the evidence is there, and the clause is there, and the statement of case in the FTT, which is before the district judge, refers to the in contemplation of part, which, as an alternative to incidental to, would have tied the whole thing together. We then get to the appeal, and uh, Milan Friend then says, ah, oh, well, yeah, it's incidental to, and he didn't point the district judge to evidence which would have tied it all together. 
and he didn't use the word contemplation, even though the clause is there. In my submission, it would be um, unfair uh, if my client were to be effectively hoisted on the way that junior counsel put it in front of the district judge when there wasn't anyone sort of taking an alternative point. But it wasn't just a difference of saying it's incidental to or in contemplation of. It was in both cases, whichever one he was going for, saying you don't need any evidence for this. Yes, and I, I, well, that would be a massive problem if there hadn't really been any evidence. But is it, is it any different if, if counsel called a witness and said, and the witness gives evidence on a particular point, and counsel says to the judge, actually, I've called evidence about this, but you don't need to look at it. You don't need any evidence of this. And judge says, completely agree. I don't need any evidence of this. And then the Court of Appeal says, actually, you did need evidence of it. But you had the witness evidence on the transcript, which proved the point. Yes, but th th there comes a time when a judge has to analyse the sufficiency of evidence. Yes. It's not just a matter of it being available, but he's got to look at it and say, well, is it sufficient for me to reach a determination, as I am being asked to do, as to these costs being incidental to the Section 146? Yes, and that, that's, I accept that. Um, and I would... Uh, I suppose if it were some other situation, I might accept that that was a, a, an onerous inquiry to make. But in well, this, no, it's, it's, it's an evidential burden and a legal burden. The evidential burden is on the, the local authority, yes. and the legal burden is on the local authority. And the fact that you get past the first base, because there is the available evidence that you take us to now, um, it's for the judge below to decide whether you've satisfied the legal burden here. If I could boldly reverse that, had Deputy District Judge Paul said, I've looked at this witness statement and I've looked at this letter of claim, that's not good enough, then I would appeal him on the basis that that's wrong. It would be flatly contrary to what was decided in Kent Square and it would be contrary to what I say is the relatively low hurdle that you need to establish the linkage. So, um, on the basis that I, I would say that I could have appealed him if he'd rejected it, then I say that it is permissible for me to tell this court that he, had the, that he did have enough evidence tested that way. And I, my submission comes down to this, my lady. You, one, a landlord does not need a great deal of evidence to fit within a clause like Clause 3.9. It's clearly, there's no automatic right, and there clearly may be cases your ladyship gave one example. I gave another one at a different stage of these proceedings where it's clear that it's not in contemplation. But in the ordinary run of cases where you've served a letter of claim, all options are open, you've got your FTT determination, you've gone to the county court for costs, you really don't need much, is my submission. And I say there was enough. OK. So does that... Um, take us to the respondent's notice? Um, you're seeking to uphold the decision for other reasons. Yes. Uh, just, just. Yes, I'm just checking my, my yes, note. Oh, sorry. I, no, no, no. Um, so I rewrote it at, at lunchtime um, to try and make sure that I could get through this sufficiently quickly. Um, I would very briefly, I think, just refer, just so we don't lose sight of them, about the incidental two points, the points which were uh, paragraphs 41 to 43. We, we've dealt with the point that, uh, as a fact, uh, the appellant was in arrears by the date of the decision in front of the deputy district judge. Uh, and indeed, in the transcript, right at the end, he actually says he doesn't object to the judgment being entered. When you were saying uh, paragraphs 42 and 43... Of my skeleton. I, I was going to say of your skeleton. Yes. Yeah. Which is about the... Uh, 41 and 42 is the factual point. 43 yeah. is the point I made that the very purpose of this clause, it would be irrelevant even if he had uh, paid. Um, I'm not sure I have time really to take you to, to Chaplair, but Chaplair and Kamari... Um, is another case where costs were ordered and 
I, I did make the point that the lead judgment there was given by Lady Justice Arden, despite the judgment in contract rail. She, in Chapelair and Kamari, said you can make an order for the uh, FTT part of the proceedings, etc., even if uh, the claim had been allocated to the small claims track, which had happened in Chapelair but not here. So that, I think, deals with those points, my lady. Uh, I had a very short uh, point on the Willans case, because my learned friend said it was her best authority, and I was very little to do with that. Uh, Willans is at tab 13 of the bundle. Uh, my learned friend took you to page 203 and said that there was more evidence in Willems than we have in this case. Uh, and she referred you to, to paragraph 11 and section 146 notices. Uh, you can see from the date, the 146 notices referred to in paragraph 11 are historic 146 notices, not current 146 notices. Uh, my second point is that um, the significant point is paragraph 13, is the internal uh, memos. And paragraph 14, which is effectively the ratio, paragraph 14 says that having seen the express instructions, uh, the tribunal is satisfied that service of a 146 notice was clearly in contemplation. There isn't any reference in that, which is the, decide, the decision part or the decision paragraph. There's no reference to the historic 146 notice. It turn, turn, it's entirely turning on the internal communication of paragraph 13. And with that, then, yes, my lady, we go to the respondent's notice. Um, lady, the respondent's notice skeleton is in the appeal bundle at uh, paragraph, uh, page 17. Um, respondents notice ground one the, is, about, is about the letter or alternatively the indirect evidence of the, of the letter and is it enough so in, in a sense we've dealt with the argument about that you, you have my submissions the letter was there or there was evidence of the letter that was enough evidence it was enough whether it's in contemplation of or incidental to. This is the point where I have to uh, confront the proposition about whether I should be entitled to rely on the in contemplation part of the clause. I I'd submit that I should be able to rely on it. Um, I don't want to go over old ground, and I know that wasn't the way it was put, but the evidence was there and there was reliance on the clause. And now, if, you're, if your lordships are uh, are otherwise with my learned friend and think that it was not incidental to it, but it might have been in contemplation of, then in my submission, uh, since it's a contractual point and the evidence was there, um, I ought to be able to rely upon it. Uh, and that is a pure respondent's notice point because it's not a cross appeal, it's just upholding the district judge for a different reason. And. Deputy District Judge Paul's judgment is not illuminating. We're just supposing that there was thought to be a difficulty in saying that you could run that on the basis of the existing respondents' notice. Where are you there? If, 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 if what stood in front of me was a procedural hurdle that the way the existing respondent's notice is drafted isn't, isn't effectively good enough, then I, I would apply to amend the respondent's notice. It, it looked, as I said, it looked like it was good enough when ground three was there. I appreciate that it's up to my learned friend and she's entitled to pull ground three, but I, if that happens, then I would submit that I ought, again in fairness, to be permitted to amend that paragraph of the respondent's notice to rely on in contemplation without ground three to, to hang it on. Where's your actual notice as opposed to the skeleton? Uh, it's at the back of the supplemental bundle, my lady. Thank you. Yes, I've got it. Thank you. 
page 190. My lady, yes. So you would say that supposing that contemplation is regarded as a new point, um, nevertheless, in fairness, you should be allowed to run it because it's essentially a point of law in the circumstances. And uh, had it been raised either earlier, either before the district judge or uh, in the existing respondent's notice, the result would have been the same from Mr. Khan's point of view. There's no prejudice. Yes, in, in a nutshell, my lord, uh, and that it would uh, it would have been drafted differently had ground three not been put the way it was, because this is drafted very precisely as a response to ground three. But in fact, what's ground three's been pulled, and then the same point in effect put as part of ground two. Um, but I, I think you probably have, otherwise all of my arguments about respondents' notice ground one, it comes down to a very narrow point about what evidence is required, what the evidence was. Uh, respondents' notice ground two is actually two grounds, um, one short, one long. Um, the, the, sh the short ground is that um, it, it's not a binary result because uh, the claim was not simply advanced under the contract, but it was advanced as a general costs point. And if one turns to the, the, the uh, application notice, which is at page 158, Uh, this is the application which was before Dis Deputy District Judge Paul. Uh, they're not numbered, but the first paragraph is the contractual costs point. The second paragraph is simply saying we're entitled to costs anyway, including the costs of the FTT, because this they weren't. Is, this is back in the. So this is in bundle. the. It's in the appeal bundle. Yes, the yes. AB. At page 158, my lady. Thank you. So there were two entirely separate paragraphs. So it was squarely before Deputy District Judge Paul that he should simply award costs within his costs jurisdiction. And um, both were mentioned in the skeleton argument as well. So, so the respondents notice ground 2A, uh, if, if in fact one needs this to be in a respondent's notice, um, is simply that even if the contractual costs point were all wrong, that would eliminate the ability to get the FTT cost element, but it would not eliminate Deputy District Judge Paul's jurisdiction to award the costs of the court part of proceedings. Is, and that, the reason, is that what he did? Well, I say that he did because he accepts, his judgment simply says, I accept what the claimant's counsel says. And the claimant's counsel did put it on both bases in his skeleton argument. Did he do that all in, in the transcript? I'm not sure whether he did it orally in the transcript because he rather runs the two together because he starts with the costs and he then starts about uh, CPR 44.5. I'm not sure that I can say that he does put it at the, uh, in his oral submissions that he develops the point. Um, 
But even if he even if he didn't, it's in the it's in the application notice, and it's it's a very it's a very straightforward point, um, and it goes to the point as to whether or not even if Malone and Friends' appeal is is completely right about the contractual cost clause, which I don't accept, whether that means that my client gets nothing at all out of the process of pursuing uh, Mr. Khan for his uh, arrears. And, and the answer should be, well, no, because the deputy district judge could always award the costs in court. This is only actually, this case is all about the FTT cost element. So his costs order would have to be revisited because no doubt he ordered too much because the cost schedules included the FTT costs. But also bear in mind that there were two cost schedules. The costs claimed were £30,000 and he awarded twenty. Um, I mean, he said he was giving indemnity costs, but he really didn't, because he said they weren't proportionate. Proportionate doesn't come into an indemnity assessment. So the council had, had two cost schedules which totaled thirty thousand pounds or thereabouts, and they got twenty. Um, obviously, at this stage in, in in my submissions, I'm not asking you to, to assess what the court element of the costs would be, but I I can tell you that we would put it at more than ten thousand pounds. So there is a real point there, and we would simply say, even if we were wrong about everything else, Deputy District Judge Paul did, and if not, should have, awarded costs under his ordinary cost jurisdiction of the court part. So that's it's as simple as that on the first part of the response of ground two. Ground two B is more difficult, which is developed at paragraph ten of my skeleton argument. Um, uh, and this is squarely based on Avon, Grand Rent and Child. <coughs> Avon, Grand Rent and Child holds, not binding on this court of course, but it is uh, a two-judge tribunal of the upper tribunal, and it holds that you can get the FTT costs under section 51. And that's at tab 16. And the authorities bundle. Uh, it's, uh, it's a decision of, of Mr. Justice Holgate, who was then, um, I think, the uh, president of the Mounds Chamber, and his honour Judge Hodge. Um, they were double hatting, so parts of this are actually both of them sitting as county court judges, but parts of it are sitting as upper tribunal judges. Paragraph um, 60 is the most important part. Uh, and at paragraph 60, uh, the judges uh, accept that the costs of the proceedings in the FTT fell within the scope of section 51 as forming costs of and incidental to the proceedings in the county court since the case had been sent to the FTT by order of that court. What about the bit before that, which I think says the FTT has no power to deal with the costs? Well, the, F the FTT has the FTT has no power to deal with court with the court element of costs. The FTT does have power to deal with costs in the FTT under Rule Thirteen. Is that consistent with the first sentence, paragraph sixteen? Yes. It says what should have happened is, I probably misunderstood, the FTC should have confined itself to determining the reasonableness of the pre-issue costs as an administration charge, and should then have left the determination of the costs of the proceedings, including those before the FTT, to be determined by the county court. Yes. So the FTT has, has a yet further jurisdiction, which is that uh, if they are duly claimed as such, the, the costs of... Uh, it, the costs of a land of a tenant default um, 
may be a variable administration charge for the purposes of Schedule 11 of the 2002 Act. And if that is the case, the FTT does have jurisdiction over them. In fact, possibly even though they may be court costs. Well, I followed that, and I'm probably just, just misunderstanding it. But it seems to be being said that they should have left the determination of the costs of the proceedings, including those before the FTT, to be determined by the county court. Yes. So it's not merely that the county court has power to deal with them, but the FTT should have left them alone. Or am I misreading that? No, he, that, that, is, that is what the, um, uh, what the upper tribunal is saying there. And it, I mean, is that surprising? Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's possibly partly due to the context, because the FTT judge had been double-hatting as well. Um, so a lot of this is about the confusion between the two jurisdictions uh, and double hatting. But no, I don't, I don't think that is, uh, that is consistent because um, what the FTT was pur purporting to do was to determine the costs of the proceedings as a whole, not under Rule 13, which was the only jurisdiction it had, but under administration charge, which was a jurisdiction it didn't have on the facts of the case. So if it wasn't Rule 13 and it wasn't an administration charge, they shouldn't have touched them, I think is what the upper tribunal is saying. So, so just to be clear, in this case, did the FTT have power to determine the costs of the FTT proceedings? Under Rule 13, yes. And it did make a decision, didn't it? It decided that Mr Khan's defence was unreasonable, but, but nevertheless, in the exercise of its discretion, it wouldn't um, make him pay any costs. Yes. Well, how can the county court then revisit that? If that was something that, that was open to the FTT to decide, why is that not raised judicata between the parties? Um, that, the, the res judicata point has been um, raised and dismissed in another case. Yes, it, it, that argument was dismissed in Chaplair and Kumari because the same thing happened. Uh, Chaplair and Kumari is, a, is at uh, tab 14. Um, so, uh, the the decision was that it was a content. It was a the usual form of clause, which you can see at the top of page two hundred and nine. And the decision at the end was that the costs, including the FTT, could be recovered. But you can see at paragraph seven of the judgment, also on page two hundred and nine, that. An application under what is now Rule 13, it's the forerunner of Rule 13, had been made and had failed. So the previous... Yeah, yes, no, that's a slightly different point. I understand entirely, but if you've got a contractual right to costs, the fact that a court in its discretion has not given you costs doesn't stop you from relying on your contract. But, but we're now contemplating that you don't have a contractual right to costs, and you're asking the county court to give you the costs... The FTT proceedings under Section 51, as, yes. as being incidental to county court proceedings in circumstances where the FTT itself has already exercised the discretion over the same costs and said no. That seems to me to be a slightly different from, from Chapter and, and Kumari. Uh, I see that. It's, um, I, I will accept that until your Lordship said it, I had not seen that distinction. Having seen it, then I'd submit that it doesn't. Uh, lead to a res judicata because the FTT's jurisdiction is so strictly circumscribed both by Rule 13 and by the interpretation of Rule 13 in the Willow case which is, is all set out uh, in the FTT's decision. So all that the FTT is deciding is that it doesn't meet the very high threshold effectively wasted costs in Rule 13 and so I don't accept that that means you can't simply have costs on the ordinary basis in the county court under Section 51. I see. Thank you. And the, uh, the point about... I don't... I don't uh, obviously sorry, just before you go, I'm still getting myself confused. Just going back to paragraph 16, just help me on the sentence after the sentence I was quizzing you on. Um, the FTT's power to make an award 
is restricted by Rule 13, and the appellant accepted at the hearing before us that the rule wasn't engaged. So why wasn't Rule 13 engaged in Avon Ground Road? Uh, possibly because um, they hadn't been unreasonable. I see. That's an easier jump for the county court then to say, well, the tribunal couldn't have awarded costs even if they'd wanted to. So we will now give the costs of the tribunal yes. documentation, etc., etc. But um, my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent's point is that um, this wasn't just that the tribunal said, we don't accept that Mr. Khan has been unreasonable. They actually say he was unreasonable, but in our discretion, we determined that there should be no award of cost because of yes. disability. Yes. So isn't that a little bit more than that which happened in Chaplair? Yes, it. I, I see that it is. Uh, it is different, but the 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 reason why I would still maintain my position it is because the reason that the FTT determined it in that way was because they were faithfully applying um, the guidance which they set out in huge detail from the Willow Court management case which uh, is a for want of a better word it is a significant gloss on rule 13 because it, it's, it's Willow which says well just because you've got unreasonable behaviour under rule 13 doesn't mean that you should uh, make an order um, and in their discretion the FTT within that context determined that there were reasons not to. Now those, the way that discretion is exercised I would submit is different, fundamentally different from the discretion which would be exercised by the court. I, I'm not necessarily saying that none of what they said could come in under a, under a CPR 44 um, assessment, but you, you can take into account conduct of the parties, for instance. But the way the FTT expressed themselves, I, I would suggest, is not a way that a court could have said, well, in effect, uh, because of the particular circumstances which your ladyship referred to of, of this particular appellant, we're going to award nothing, even though the claimant has won the case and um, is on the face of it entitled to costs, and he's been found to be unreasonable, which would be a reason to award costs against him under the conduct part of CPR 44. Uh, let's just, just remind myself of the criteria. But that, that I would submit, is, is the difference. And so I, I, for that reason, I don't accept that the distinction which your ladyship has drawn, which I accept is there is a distinction, um, is one which disqualifies Deputy District Judge Paul from having granted costs of the FTT element of it, which is effectively what your ladyship and my, la my Lord, Lord Justice Nuji are suggesting. Nobody was there to put the point on behalf of Mr Khan, were they? That if he was going into um, a, a cost regime other than the contractual costs situation, that he should bear in mind that the first year tribunal had said, having considered the matter, we come to the conclusion that that would not be appropriate. Uh, no, I appreciate that that's a, 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 a quite a technical point which you wouldn't expect a litigant in person necessarily to be able to make. Well, I didn't think he was there. I think it suggested that Mr. Khan didn't turn up again in the afternoon. No, that's at that's at the. FTT. The previous one. That's the previous yes. FTT. He definitely was there for the whole of the, di the district right. judges' hearing. Um, the, an answer which I'll, I'll now put more forcefully, having, having found CPR 44.43, there's a list of uh, matters which the court can have regard to. Yeah. And the particular point the FTT was entitled to take into account at the Willow Court is not, I, I respectfully submit, in the list of factors under CPR 44.3. 44.4. So, uh, um, well, is it in 44.43 that the court is not entitled to take into account the, um, the determination of the, 
tribunal. No, I don't think 44.43 uh, addresses that particular point at all. The way I would submit that works is either there's a point which is because it was dealt with in the tribunal, it means that the court couldn't deal with those costs again, which I don't accept because Rule 13 is an entirely different jurisdiction based on much narrower grounds than the court's general jurisdiction. Or it's to do with the factors which led the FTT to decide as it did. And those factors are not factors which appear in 44.43. Again, it is a different jurisdiction. So for all of those reasons, I, I, I come back to the point that it was um, open to the district judge to make an order exactly as in Avon and Child. And so the deputy district judge's decision can be upheld on exactly the same basis. Even if we couldn't get the contractual costs, Section 51 was raised specifically in the application notice, and you get to the same result by a different route. Yeah, OK. Um, I know, my, my lady. It, uh, it, it, no, it, it's my fault for asking too many questions, I'm sure, but I'm terribly sorry. Um, I'll try and finish off as, as quickly as possible, um, my lady, because... Um, So yes, the um, uh, respondent's uh, skeleton, which of course is back in the appeal bundle, yes. I should have removed it. Oh, sorry, just before you move on, if you're, you're, are you moving on to the next ground? Uh, if so, you've mentioned the decision of uh, the deputy uh, president in Roman, John Roman's Park Homes in the <coughs> Um, I thought I should. It, it, quite, it, it isn't in the bundle. Is that because there is no actual transcript of it? Uh, no, it, it's 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 not in the bundle. I thought I thought I'd done my job by by raising it. My learned friend didn't ask for it to be put in the bundle, so it's it's not there. Um, there is a, trans, a transcript of it. I mean, speaking for myself, I would be grateful for a copy. Um, in case the point arose. Unusual. It's the county court at Weymouth sitting in this building. Um, since, since you've now asked, and I know I'm trespassing beyond the point, but I, I am responding directly to a point made by the court. There, there are some, some points which I ought to, uh, if I may, in, in, inform the, the court about uh, points in this which are different. Um, I thought I ought to refer to it, but you've got to be very careful because it is a Park Holmes case. And the jurisdiction, it's very similar, the transfer jurisdiction in Park Holmes cases, but it's not absolutely identical. Um, because there is most of the Park Holmes legislation, the county court does not have concurrent jurisdiction. Um, so it's actually a transfer under Section 231, capital B of the Housing Act, rather than Section 176A of the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act. Um, the uh, other point, uh, apart from just uh, making the arguments which I make in my skeleton argument of paragraph 14, which address some, at least some of the points that the uh, 
uh, Deputy President made in the John Romans case, uh, he's, he's entirely wrong, um, with all due respect, to rely on Section 29 of the uh, Tribunals, Courts and Enforcement Act. As I pointed out, the, the, the lacuna point about the difference between England and Wales is they don't have an FTT in Wales, and the transfers go the same way. So you'd have the really odd situation that if, uh, the LVT in Wales would be governed by a completely different set of principles. Um, and, and paragraph 42, um, I would respectfully submit uh, the learned deputy president uh, has gone quite badly wrong because he says that section 176 A and B is all framed by reference to the Tribunals, Courts and Enforcement Act. Uh, and the reason I say he's wrong about that uh, is because, and if, if your lordships could simply note that, there is an identical pre-existing transfer provision in paragraph 3 of Schedule 12 to the Commonhold and Leasehold Reform Act of 2002. That came into force in 2002, and it still applies in Wales, and it is identical to Section 176A. So the argument that Section 176A is all carefully designed to dovetail with the, uh, the new tribunal jurisdiction under the 2007 Act is, uh, with great respect to the learned Deputy President, not right. Um, and the other broad points that I would make are the ones which are set out in paragraph 14 of my skeleton argument, which support Avon and Child. Uh, and perhaps the, the, at the kernel of this is the point that a lot of these costs cases under Section 51 are dealing with costs of first instance versus costs of the appeal. This is not what we're dealing with, nor are we dealing with entirely different proceedings. 176A is a simple transfer of part of the costs for a question to be answered. And all that the FTT actually does is it answers the question, and then its determination is given effect to by a later order of the county court. So it, in short, while I accept, of course, the authority of the usual Section 51 cases like Wright and Bennett and Aden and in an interval. They don't actually apply, in my submission, in this particular jurisdiction. And that is a basis on which the Upper Tribunal's decision in Avon and Giles can be upheld and should have been upheld. And I say that John Romans is wrong and you should follow Mr. Justice Holgate and his honour, Judge Hodge. So that's paragraph 14. Yeah, and I think that's now, I've, I don't have time to develop the other authorities, but I've given all of the references. Respondents notice ground three I can take uh, very shortly because that is simply an argument uh, that we would be entitled to indemnity costs in any event on the basis of, uh, of conduct. The reason I mentioned that is simply because, of course, where you have a contractual costs clause, the presumption is you'll get costs on the indemnity basis, and there's no such presumption in the county court. But I don't think I need to uh, develop that point uh, in all the submissions, particularly not because we didn't really get indemnity costs anyway. Um, and respondents notice ground four, I think, is given the time, is now effectively dead in the water, which was the suggestion that this court should, uh, if it had to revisit costs, should assess the costs itself to avoid it going back to the county court. Um, but there is a time issue, and I appreciate that um, there would be several cost schedules to dissect, and your lordships might feel that that is not perhaps the job of this court. Um, and I will also confess that subsequent to writing ground four, I then noticed that in contract real, uh, Lady Justice Arden and Mr Justice Wright flatly refused <laughs> to assess the costs and sent them back. But obviously, all of that will only arise if the appeal succeeds. Is there anything further with which I can assist my, lord, my lady, my lord? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Ms. Simak, your response? I want 
have much to say, but perhaps I will focus initially on um, round two and if you have several The respondent maintains that forfeiture proceedings are contemplated, yet they made a simple debt claim and, uh, uh, in the county court and presented it to the district judge later on that this was a case of forfeiture. That is not a disputed issue. Um, yet again, uh, all they do is threaten to make a claim that at that point they plainly could not have yet made by means of a letter that they have not served to Mr. Khan and it has to be accepted the letter wasn't served to Mr. Khan and that it has to be a reason that they now seek him to serve that letter and for the first time that letter was served was on the 2nd of March 2022. Um, that but I mean that's an assertion that you're making when you say it's got to be accepted that it wasn't served or it wasn't it sent. An it's an assertion I'm making with reference to the fact that the respondent themselves accept that this is a new piece of evidence and hence they're seeking to introduce it to the court. Well, no, 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 no. What, what the respondent is doing is saying that this is fresh evidence in terms of it not being before the court before, not that no. it didn't exist before or that we weren't aware of it before. Um, Indeed, my lady. The, um, the more narrow point I'm making is that Mr. Khan didn't have that letter and that it is a relevant fact. Yes, but that's an assertion. It is an assertion yes. that I'm making that Mr. Khan didn't have the letter. Yes. Um, and even if he hadn't had the letter, what Mr. Rainey said is that if you look at the authorities, the fact that it's you it was even um, produced, shows that it was in contemplation. That's the contemplation point. Indeed, and the question then arises whether the mere drafting of the letter that was not served is enough to show that contemplation, and I would be inviting the court to find that it isn't. Right. Even with reference to the authorities that my own friend refers to, this is quite a distinct situation. The, uh, this is a particular case where the actual evidence that was available to the district judge, to district judge Hall, uh, on the day uh, was um, much poorer than in all the other cases we do have in the bundle. My learned friend, in fact, referred to a similar letter in um, uh, Ken Square case stating that there could not be evidence clearer than that. The difference, of course, is, as I just outlined, that may so be, but that letter was served on the party, and our letter wasn't. And at this point, I know that my own friend says that had District Judge Paul seen that letter and rejected it as not good enough, he would have appealed that. But that does bring the point of what the appellant will have done if he had seen that letter, and that we would, would have been standing here today at all had he seen that letter before 2nd of March 2022. That is also a relevant point that um, arises out of that submission. Um, I did make a point that I don't want to labor because I already made it, uh, that the burden of contemplating a set of proceedings should be set higher. And uh, this reference to all the authorities, uh, th this court is asked to uh, consider whether indeed the burden should be set higher than indicating that a letter has been drafted, and that is what the court seems to do. In Mr. Khan's circumstances, it cannot be said, and that is a contention on behalf of Mr. Khan, of course, that the respondent demonstrated at the time of District Judge Hall's judgment that forfeiture proceedings were contemplated, given that the only thing that District Judge had on the day was the witness statement referring to a letter that was not before the court and my own friend says could have been produced if requested. It is of course relevant and it goes towards the uh, issue of cost and I don't wish to dwell on it but my own friend addressed it and I feel that I should speak to on behalf of my client that um, the respondent is clear that the letter is a fresh evidence. That letter clearly is a piece of uh, quite a key piece of evidence when considering the contemplation in the round and service is important. 
but it's not just the service that is an issue here. What we have is that this letter does not actually feature in any of the claims. It doesn't feature in any of the appeals decisions or fatalities. It only features in that limited document, the first appeal. Nothing is said about that letter in appeal. Uh, you mentioned before they have their amended grounds. That should have triggered the response that the petition wasn't received. They had the skeleton and they had they had our skeleton, they had their own skeleton. They had the ability to reply. Practice Direction 52C, paragraph 19, tells what respondents' actions should be when served with the appellant's notice. And they could have filed a statement saying that that evidence existed, we object to that, and perhaps proceedings would have stopped at earlier stage. Um, so they've had a chance to reply, and they had an opportunity at the hearing to address that. So the fact that we now have this letter as of 2nd of March 2022 is a relevant fact, we think. And that should already limit the course. At most, we will come to four courts, as my own friend indicated. And But at that point, well, first of all, I would argue that even the county court cost should not be payable simply because, uh, for the reasons stated, there is no contractual cost can be established in this case. So this particular respondent should have accepted the decision of the first year appellate tribunal, and in fact, no cost was awarded, and there will be no proceedings in the county court at all. So there can be no proceedings in terms of cost follows the event because that should not. That is not something that should have been taking place. But, um, but, but Mr. Khan didn't accept the first year tribunal's he decision. Did not, uh, I'm getting to that, my lady. Uh, yes, but given the fact that Mr. Khan didn't accept the decision, then perhaps the proportion of that cost is the um, is all that could be expected of the appellant to pay in the circumstances. And if we look at the schedules, and again, I do not wish to dwell on that because, as my own friend established, it's not this court's job to look at the schedules. But just to make the wide point, um, the majority of the cost in the schedule actually relates to the first year tribunal. Right, okay. So that's all I'm trying to say. I don't, I don't wish to analyze the schedule. Okay. The majority of cost in the schedule relates to the first year tribunal. So if the court finds that, um, and that's with reference to the response notices, that some amount is payable and needs to be assessed later, then uh, perhaps it has to be pointed, uh, the court would be invited to effectively point out that uh, a proportion of that cost should be reassessed. Because on the basis that the £20,000 award is made, and the vast majority of those costs being the FTT cost, that should be significantly should be reduced should the court be against Mr. Cameron's case. All right. So if we, if we find that there's no contractual right to the costs, then you're saying that the discretion of the court should have been exercised more favourably towards Mr. Khan because of the proportion of costs in the first year tribunal and everything that's arisen from that. Okay. In, in, in essence, yes, my lady, because as it is stated in the uh, briefly in Skelton argument that of course the resolution of the issue depends on the um, uh, Rule 13 decision and it is relevant to indemnity courts and the very fact that the uh, first, year, uh, first year tribunal has considered the issue has found that the uh, appellant has behaved unreasonably and has made a decision not to award any costs um, should be a weighty consideration in this Then briefly, in relation to notice ground two, um, it is submitted that uh, the ground turns on the interpretation of paragraph 21 of the district judge Paul's judgment, and it is a loosely stated conclusion, if I may say so, uh, in lordships. That is at page 85. If you look at paragraph 21, which is the last paragraph in the judgment, A 
a more detailed assessment would be needed of what Mr. Judge Paul meant. when he recorded those conclusions. So because, of course, he says, it is quite plain from the way in which the law is structured that those courts are recallable. And to be for the only question we have to resolve today, the only question I have to resolve today is if those courts are recallable in law and how much, and that is my decision. And that, of course, is the final conclusion to the uh, to him accepting, in essence, all the submissions that were made by counsel on the local authorities' behalf. And overlooking the fact that the first year tribunal, of course, would be at least contentious at some point. Sorry. The, 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 the contention could have been raised I see. Um, that the uh, costs aren't and given that Mr. Khan was a dispensing person, that is something that... Well, you, what you'd say is the submission could have been made but it was um, uh, costs being considered under the county court uh, the jurisdiction that this would have had some resonance or should have had some resonance with the DDJ that another tribunal had considered this point and decided not to, so in the exercise of your discretion, you shouldn't do. But this is all on the basis that we don't find the contractual basis for the costs order. I, I'm afraid that I, I'm, I'm unable to discern from what um, DDJ Paul said on what basis it was proceeding, or if it was a mixture between the two. But better heads than me are sitting alongside. So that is something that I. Think should have been pointed out in relation to Mr. Khan. All right, so you ask us to take that into account. Uh, yes. And um, again, I'm not going to dwell on, uh, on, on much longer. So uh, in, in relation to notice ground three, all I'm going to say is, again, the resolution of this part of the argument, again, does depend on whether the 69 marina contractual court is wrong. And uh, again, I would reiterate that Rule 15 decision is relevant to the issue and demonstrates the need under this head of the argument. And um, as to notice ground four, you will have noticed that, that, that we did agree with my learned friend Sonia Kim that um, um, the court should reassess, but we also heard um, the indication that it's not going to. It's not yes, going Mr. To Rainey isn't pushing that, I don't think. No. no, no neither, neither do I. Right. Um, I don't have any more submissions to make. No, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rainey. Uh, my, my lady was just, <coughs> you know, I, I, I asked your lordships and, and my lady to write down that section of the Common Old and Leasehold Reform Act, which was referred to in John Rome. did. I'd completely overlooked the fact that just before I came out, I did actually print it off. So I should have just handed it in. You. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Can you make sure that Miss Simon gets a copy too? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very sorry. I should have remembered I did it. Thank you very much. And, and I did it in a hurry, and so I haven't got a tab through oh, the... Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Thank yeah. you. Oh, um, we will obviously reserve judgment... Um, as um, both you, Mr. Rainey, and you, Ms. Simak, know, when we send out a draft, it's an opportunity for you to correct our English but not our reasoning. Um, we will get the judgment out to you as soon as possible, but there's obviously quite a lot to think about. So thank you both very, very much uh, for your oral submissions today and also for the, um, the care that you took in preparing the written submissions. And um, well done on the timing too.